all of worship. We have seen the light of God. On high mountains of celebration, we have seen the light of God. Through the bitter storm of betrayal, we have seen the light of God. With eyes that have been opened, we have seen the light of God. Please join me in hymn 562, Ye Thou My Vision.
two tables of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron saw all the people of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he gave them a commandment, all that the, all that the Lord had spoken with him <coughs> in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with him, he put it there on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And when he came out, he <coughs> and told the people of Israel what he was commanded. The people of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses would put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. The next scripture reading is Luke 9, verses 28 through 36, which can be found on page 900 of your three Bibles. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered, and his raiment became dazzling white. And behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but kept awake, and they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he said this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silence and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now it's time with the children by singing one verse of Jesus' Christ.
guys looking at me like, Mom, this is a good, good thing. <laughs> I hope it does. <laughs> it did on the camera, I mean, right? Strange when you think about it. 
I think today is another example. If you listen to these two scriptures today, today in church, if you look at your bulletin, you open it up and you look at this Sunday, it says something like, oh, what does it say? It says, Transfiguration of the Lord. Transfiguration of the Lord. Now, transfiguration is not a word that I usually use in normal conversation. How about you? Is that, is that a word you use? Yeah, you don't, you don't use. What about the English teacher? You, do you use that in your class a lot? Transfiguration? No, I teach middle school, so that. Oh, well, it blows most of our minds. Even in here, transfiguration, it's, it's not a word we use in everyday conversation. Uh, it's one of those words that we probably don't hear at all outside of church. I bet you don't, you don't ever hear that word outside of church. It's sort of like the word prodigal. You know the word prodigal? We're all pretty familiar with the story of the prodigal son, right? But how often do you hear the word prodigal outside of church? You know? Uh, well, prodigal, you know, it simply means one who spends resources freely or over-extravagantly. It's a pretty simple definition. Spends the resources freely and over-extravagantly. But we never use the word prodigal outside of the Bible. You know, not even when Julia is talking to me about buying my fishing supplies. <laughs> She doesn't use that word, that, that term. And today, the term that we have before us is transfiguration. It's a day in the church that's actually called Transfiguration of Our Lord Sunday. What is this all about? Transfiguration Sunday. Well, that's what you're here to find out this morning. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Transfiguration. You know, I, I just recently graduated from seminary and I had to go look it up. I went to look the word up. And transfiguration is sort of like, actually, the word Joan was using and when she was talking, it's sort of like transformation. And, you know, have you ever seen the Transformers movies? You know, and so you get an idea, you know, those things transform into, I don't know what they transform into. But anyway, you know, transformation. Well, this is, this is similar to that. This is transfiguration. Transfiguration focuses on appearance. On appearance. So when Jesus appeared in dazzling white in the gospel story today, he was transfigured. He was dramatically changed in appearance, in how he looked to anyone that would have been looking at him. His appearance was changed in some way. So transfiguration refers to being dra dramatically changed in appearance. Transfiguration can also signal a change that glorifies or exalts somebody. So if there were any seminary people here, I'd have to throw that in too. Uh, but those fit with our biblical stories today of both Moses and Jesus, you know, a, a glorifying or exalting or so, of someone that's being transfigured as well. So both of these two scriptures have to do with transfiguration. In the Exodus reading, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand that God has just presented to him. So Aaron and all the Israelites, they were really confused and really upset because Moses looked different. His appearance was different. They were looking at the tablets of the covenant he had in his hand. They were looking at his face. His face was shining so brightly that Aaron and the others could not stand it. And evidently, Moses' face was shining so brightly because he had just been speaking with God. Now, 
They didn't have sunglasses back then. So, so Aaron asked Moses to put a veil over his face. When, when any time. And that, that seemed to work. Seemed to work okay. So it says that then from then on, whenever Moses went up Mount Sinai to talk to God, he had the veil off. But when he came back down, he would put the veil back on his face so that he could hang out with Aaron and the rest of the Israelites. He had that veil on, at least until the whole shiny, glowy thing wore off on his face and he could take it back off. So I was thinking about that and I was thinking about it really didn't happen to me this year, but it's happened to me many years and I bet it's happened to you in the past. In a winter, when we've had significant snow, and the sun's been out for a few days, a little of that snow has melted and it's refrozen again, and you walk outside and the sun is shining and the sun is bouncing off that snow and it's hitting you so brightly in the face that you can't even see. I know, I know that has to have has happened to you. It certainly has happened to me. And, and, and Or perhaps if you're on the west side of a lake, which is where Julia and I happen to live now. And on a cloudless day, when the sun rises and it hits that lake water just right and bounces up into your face, I mean, the brilliance of God's creation is just reflected off that water or off that snow, if you relate more to the snow. And it's blinding. It's blinding to us. Maybe that's what happened to Moses after he spoke with God. The glory of God was so strong that it was reflecting off of his face. It was reflecting, reflecting off of his very being so much so that it was blinding Aaron and the Israelites. But after a time, Moses didn't need that veil anymore. After a time, the transfiguration of Moses shining God's glory wore off. And you know that's that's sort of how life works for all of us. If we don't watch it, we lose our shine. There's no doubt that we, like Moses, we, we need times to recharge our souls. Times where we encounter God. It may be in the outdoors. It may be somewhere else for you. We need times when we encounter God's people so that we too can reflect God's light to others. But after too long, without prayer, without worship, too long away from a community of, of Christian faith, our countenance, what we show outwardly to others in the world, begins to dull. We lose our shine. Adam Thomas put it this way, and I quote, Over time, our shine tends to fade. Every inhospitable word spoken, every neighbor mistreated, every resource hoarded, layers grime over our radiance. Every hand unextended, every gift squandered, and every road not taken leaves layers of apathetic dust. End quote. And then the world, the world tells us that, that the radiant things out there in the world are the things that we can acquire. They are the things that, that we purchase. When you wear shiny jewelry, or when you drive a, a, a shiny new car or truck, or, or, or when, you, when you have that shiny new house on the lake, surely you will shine. <laughs> Too often we see our light to the glossy, wasteful things of the world, and we forget that we are the ones that are supposed to shine and reflect. God's glory. Not things. Us, the children of God. 
It's almost as if we veil ourselves and we cover ourselves up, and thus we're covering up a reflection of God's glory. So moving away from Moses, today's gospel story is another take on that strange word, transfiguration. Jesus, we just heard, he takes Peter and James and John up on the mountain to pray. And when they got there, this time it's Jesus' raiment, Jesus' clothes themselves that shine in this dazzling white. And then as, as if the transfiguration, the connection to Moses' transfiguration is not enough already, then we actually read that Moses and Elijah appeared and started talking to Jesus, and they're all shining radiantly. Now, it says that Peter and his companions were pretty tired. They were sleepy. They could barely keep their eyes open. But they were struck by these amazing sights, these appearances before them. And, of course, we, we have Jesus there. You know, uh, he, he, he says, why don't I make some tents? Why don't I Tents is not really a good word because we have this Boy Scout picture of, of what tents were. We don't really have a good translation for this word again. What it's talking about is making some kind of, of structure or covering to memorialize or try to protect something that you want to remember. And that's what Peter was actually saying here. We want to we want to construct something here so we'll remember what, what's going on here, what's happening here. We want to protect this holy spot. If you will, that, that's what he was saying. He's saying, well, I want to build tents for all three of you. We're going to, this is holy spot. This, I mean, this is an amazing thing that has happened. So, so I want to memorialize it. That's what Peter is saying when he says he wants to build these tents. It always made me think, well, what do you want tents for? Not, not as we think of tents. We just don't have a good translation for that. But speak, Peter spoke those words. I want to memorialize what's happened here. I want to remember it. I want other people to know about it. As soon as he spoke those words, Moses and Eliza, Elijah are eclipsed by a cloud and they disappear. And then this booming voice comes out and says through the cloud, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. You know, when you read through the Gospels, the disciples are not always cast as the brightest of people. You know, it takes them longer to catch what's going on than anybody else, it seems like. But, in this particular case, even Peter, James, and John can figure out this transfiguration. They can figure out what was going on here. God was identifying Jesus with the glory of Moses and Elijah, two great prophets and leaders who themselves reflected God's glory all through their lives. But also the stakes were sort of being raised here at this particular transfiguration because Jesus was God's very son. So disciples, you should listen while you can. Listen to him. For God's shining moments sometimes pass away very quickly. Just as Moses and Elijah departed in our story, we know that Jesus, too, is going to depart before long. The disciples didn't know it yet, but Jesus' departure would be on a cross. And it would mark a beginning as well as the end of Jesus' human life. So I think it's, it's easy to be hard on Peter here, but let's not blame him. Peter was trying to be helpful. Peter was trying to preserve this, this perfect moment of God's radiance being reflected to him and James and John. And I guess Peter must have left his cell phone at home, his camera. No, wait, they didn't have it yet, did they? So he, so he couldn't take a picture of what was going on, so he said, you know, let's build these tents. Let's memorialize this spot. But, as our Alan Culpepper observed, Peter's attempt to enshrine, enshrine this experience wasn't what Jesus had in mind. Culpepper says, and I quote, faithfulness 
is not achieved by freezing a moment, but by following on in confidence that God is leading and that what lies ahead is even greater than what we've already experienced. End quote. Peter tried to stop time. He tried to mark the moment. He tried to take a picture and said, this is important. We need to remember this. But he couldn't pull it off. And neither can we. The phrase, time flies, you know, we've all heard that, how quickly time passes us by. Particularly as we get a little bit older, it seems like time goes on so quickly. Some of you guys think this term is to last in forever. But let me tell you, it's going to be over in just a second. I mean, time flies. I was talking to Thelma Maynard this week, and we were talking about how time flies, and she mentioned to me that her Andy has been gone now for almost 30 years. But to her, it seems just like yesterday. And you know, any parent, any parent in here will tell you that no matter how hard you <coughs> try, you can't stop a child from growing up. You can't stop a child from growing up. I, I know that just yesterday, it was just yesterday, that my kids were, were eight and six and four. <laughs> but today, they're 28 and 26 and 24. Even the winner of today's Super Bowl, whoever that may be, and I'm not a prognosticator, so I'll not, I'll not attempt to come up with that, but even the winner of today's Super Bowl will not be able to stop time. Because you know what? Their victory will be one for them to relish, whether it's Peyton Manning or, or, or what's the Cam, what's the Cam Newton, yeah, uh, whoever, you know, that they'll relish it, but after today, after today, when the day's over, when it's midnight, the 2015-2016 pro football season will be over. It will be over. And beginning tomorrow, tomorrow, it'll, it'll start, I'm going to start talking about preseason of 2016-2017. And you know, Joe's Jacob. Who will have just as good a chance to win Super Bowl 51 as anybody else? Go Chiefs. Green Bay. Green Bay. <laughs> Jacob's a Green Bay fan. Do you have one of those cheese wedges? Uh, no. no. <laughs> the point is, we can't stop Tom. Even all the hoopla and build up of this big event tomorrow, it will be over. And we'll be looking ahead to Super Bowl 51. Oh, why did they stop using the Roman numerals? Huh? Now it's just 5-1. Because we can't read it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't well, we can't stop time. We can't really enshrine the moment, no matter how many pictures you might take. Our shine, our shine, our reflection of God's glory is going to change whether as an individual Christian or as a church, a body of Christ. Our shine, the way we reflect God's glory, it's going to change. That is for certain. But rather than looking at this as a problem, let's welcome it. Let's welcome the challenge that this new season brings. I said the word transfiguration is pretty close to transformation. They both mean a type of change. And like it or not, life is transformed every minute of every day. The transfiguration, transfiguration, it, it points to a change in appearance as well. A change in how we see and a change in how others see us. So I ask you today, how do you see the world today? Do you see it as Martin Luther King Jr. did 53 years ago when he was speaking with one of the greatest speeches of all time with that high half green speech? How do you see the world? Has your world been transfigured as a result of Jesus Christ? As a result of what happened on the cross? In small ways or in large ways, how does your life 
reflect the shine of God's glory. I have a cousin who I talked to at length uh, last weekend when I was at my grandma's funeral. And I know a lot about him because he spends a lot of time on Facebook. He puts a lot of things on there. Talks about his daughter and a lot of different things. But for Lent, for Lent, my cousin David, he said he's going to give up spending time on Facebook. And instead of spending time on Facebook, he's going to sit down and he's going to write a handwritten note or letter every day to someone he loves. That's one way to reflect God's shine. I read of a congregation recently in Atlanta, Georgia, that's organizing a drive to get tents to Haiti before the rainy season begins in the springtime. This church has recognized the need, and they want to do something about it. They've negotiated discount prices with Coleman, uh, the Coleman Company, so they can get big discounts on the tents, and they're spending hundreds of hours organizing and trying to get together with other churches and with schools and with other groups. They are refusing to accept that so many people in Haiti every rainy season live under a sheet of plastic. They say that's not acceptable to them. So, they're going to get tents. They're going to get hundreds of tents together. They're going to take them to hate guy. They are, they are going to pledge that each one of God's children in hate guy have some sort of shelter during this rainy season. That church is trying to reflect God's glory. I know a congregation right down here in Dexter um, it's hosting a benefit this past week for three local organizations. And they're making dozens and dozens of pancakes. They have a big pancake sale that they're putting together. And they get hundreds of dollars that goes to the needy in their area. And then there are so many churches like our church that is doing this Super Bowl uh, Sunday for the needy to try to provide some extra money, some extra food for those people that are in need. That's a way to reflect the shine. There are many more stories of Christian congregations that try to reflect the glory of God and individual uh, Christians as well. One town I, I read about last summer uh, has become the talk of their, their small town because they have a community garden. And anyone can come. Anyone from the community can come to tend the garden. Anyone can pick the flowers and the vegetables for their own use. doesn't matter whether they're a church member or not. All are welcome to come and enjoy the fruit and enjoy the flowers, the fruit of God's creation. We also had a church garden last summer, didn't we? Anyone willing to help make it bigger and better this year? That's a way to reflect God's glory. Another congregation that I read about, their, their evening Bible study has become so popular that the non-Presbyterians are outnumbering the Presbyterians that are coming into the church for, for their Bible study. Should we start an evening Bible study? There are so many ways to shine and to try to reflect God's glory. Today is Transfiguration of Our Lord Sunday, a weird word for some strange stories that we have in the Bible. But maybe it is the right word after all. Maybe it's helpful for us to be reminded that though we can grow weary, though we can grow dim, the one whose shining glory we reflect is still calling us, is still challenging us to spread the word that Jesus is the Son of God, that we are transfigured people because of the good news of God's glory. As we glimpse God's glory in these Bible stories, as we catch a view of the movement of the Spirit here today, may we reflect God's glory as well. Amen. Let us now respond to our word this morning by rising in our body and spirit and singing our hymn of response, which I am Jesus shine. Of course, we have to sing that today. 
So it's number 431 in your hymnal. Let us rise and sing together.
performer of the board this morning. There are those who go hungry, 
There are those who face violence. There are, are those who suffer illness. There are those who have lost loved ones. There are those who are so hungry. But you are gracious God. You offer hope for all. We ask now that you touch all those in need at this time. May your love offer them some comfort. Just as we are offered comfort when we're in your presence in this place at this time. Be with all those that have been named in this service. Whatever their need, need may be. And be with all those that have gone unnamed in this day but who are still in our thoughts and in our prayers, who need your love, who need your touch, who need your glory at this time. May your spirit comfort them now. And our God continue to be with us as we repeat the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
I remember quite a long time ago about now. If you haven't picked up your newsletter for this month, they are back in the back, so make sure you pick those up. One of the little items in the newsletter that I really liked was about the Bible. And it said something to the effect, I can't quote it exactly, uh, but it said something to the effect, what if the, you treated your Bible like you treat your cell phone? You know? Oh, that was Jackie's? That was your little statement there? Well, thank you. Because it said something to the effect, you know, if we treat it like our cell phone, that means you'd carry it with you all the time. That means if you left it at home, you'd turn around and go back and get it. That means you would check it for messages at various times during the day. And you might spend an hour or so looking at that thing every day. What if we treated our Bibles like our cell phone? Uh, something to think about. Something to consider. A lot of neat, neat little things in the newsletter. So make sure you pick it up. Make sure uh, you look at that uh, this week. I'll remind you, I think we've got some Super Bowl guys back there in the back as you go by the, the bowl. Don't forget about that. If you've got a little change or an hour or two that you can drop in there, all the money's going to go to our food pantry, correct? So we'll help be through our food pantry right here. Judy. Good to see you. Happy birthday to Sharon. Well, she didn't play it for us. So, yeah. Yeah, we are going to sing Happy Birthday to you. So. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to Happy Birthday to you. And remember that we are called as Christians to reflect God's glory. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever it is, you can reflect God's glory because regardless of where you are or what you're doing, God is right there with you. God is right there above you. God is below you. God goes behind you. God goes before you. God stands right beside you. And most importantly of all, God is inside you as well. So shine and reflect God's glory. Amen.